You're now live on YouTube. You can start the meeting. Okay, thank you for that, and uh, thank you for attending um, to this licensing subcommittee. Uh, we're meeting um, to discuss a review of a premises license, which is seven days mini market, um, following uh, a, a representation and application made by West York Police. Um, thank you, um, Councillor Clark, Clark and T Wise, for um, joining us on this uh, committee today, and all the officers uh, who are attending. Um, I'll first go to um, John B. Cross Mitchell as the lead licensing officer to uh, give us a verbal update on the report. Um, and then we will go through our speakers and I'll invite members to, uh, to ask questions at the appropriate point. Um, John, do you want to go ahead? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, I did notice you were a little bit muffled on your microphone, so uh, you sort of dropped in and out, but um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, this is um, obviously everybody has received a, a copy of the report uh, who's in this meeting today. Um, as uh, Councillor Sutherland said, this is uh, to submit for consideration application for review of premises license under section 51 of the Licensing Act uh, 2003 and to receive any relevant representations is in relation to premises license to the sale of alcohol consumption off premises for uh, seven days mini market at 226 Pelham Lane, Halifax. Uh, an application to review the premise license was received from West Yorkshire Police. It was received on the 4th of February uh, this year, uh, and that's attached to Appendix 3. Uh, the ap application is made under Section 51 of the Licensing Act, uh, as the applicant considers that they have grounds for review in respect of three of the licensing objectives under the Licensing Act, these being the prevention of crime and disorder, public safety and the protection of children from harm. Uh, in summary, I'm just reading uh, from the report, in summary, the application uh, by West York for Police is requesting a review of the premises license uh, due to two visits to the premises with customs and trading standards where quantities of illegal tobacco products were found concealed at the premises. A copy of the application has been served on all responsible authorities and public notices of the application put outside the premises and representations regarding the application required by the 4th of March. The applicant uh, requested an extension to representation time and this was granted uh, in the interests of uh, public interest and the last day of representation was extended to the 18th of March uh, 2021 and um, Comments uh, by represents uh, re by the applicant's representatives are at Appendix Four. Um, over. So, uh, summing up is really the uh, subcommittee is determining the application with regards to the four um, licensing objectives in the Licensing Act. Those of prevention of crime and disorder, public safety, prevention of public nuisance, and protection of children from harm and in relation to the licensing policy of the council, uh, which states uh, the steps which the licensing authority considers may be necessary to ensure that the licensing objectives are promoted. The options to uh, um, subcommittee members is uh, they're all uh, outlined at uh, paragraph 10 of the report rather than go through them individually. Um, and that really sums up just a quick overview of the of the report. Thank you for that, John. And welcome. Is this your first licensing subcommittee? That you've, you've it is, yes, it is my first, first licensing subcommittee, yes. Uh, welcome to welcome to it. Um, Thank you very and much. I'll just jump straight into the application, so I will uh, take the opportunity just to remind members to declare any interest, um, if they do have any, just to have that on record. Um, Thank you, John. So are there, any, are there any questions members want to ask at this point? I understand we've got Matthew Dalton, uh, who will be representing the Shorts of Police and the applicant in this case. And by applicant, I am referring to uh, West Shorts of Police, who have applied for a review of the premises license, appreciating that normally when we come to subcommittee, the applicant is, is the person looking to gain a premises license. Um, so I would invite Matthew and, uh, and, and then, and then there'd, there'd be the opportunity for questions, and then I would invite the applicant or the applicant's agent. Um, do members have any questions at this point they want to ask? 
Chair, yeah. Chair, just quickly, I'm I'm struggling to hear you over the microphone. Um, I I picked about fifty percent of what you said. Okay. So. What I will do is I will invite my. I'm able to hear everyone else, so I will invite Matthew to speak. Um, and then I will see if I can work out my microphone problem after that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's Matt Dalton, I'm the licensing officer for uh, Calderdale, um, <coughs> obviously employed by West Yorkshire Police. Um, and as has been mentioned by uh, Mr. B. Croft Mitchell, we're uh, looking in at uh, a review of the license for seven days in Mini Market at 226 Pelham Lane in Halifax. Uh, the premises license reference number is 0110. Um, <clears throat> as has already been mentioned, the uh, three aspects of the licensing objectives that we're looking at are the uh, prevention of crime and disorder, uh, public safety and the protection of children from harm. Um, basically, the circumstances being that uh, on Monday the 14th of December uh, last year, 2020, Trading Standards Officers conducted a test purchase operation in the Halifax area, uh, following intelligence that they received indicating that some shops within the uh, town were selling counterfeit cigarettes. Uh, one of the premises that they visited on that day was Seven Days Mini Market at 226 Pelham Lane. Um, and they were uh, able to obtain a, um, a packet of counterfeit cigarettes, uh, Richmond cigarettes it was, that were purchased for a value of £5. The normal price of that item being in excess of £10 um, and over £6 of which would normally be paid in excise duty. Uh, as a result of the test purchase operation on that day, officers from Trading Standards and Coldale Neighbourhood Policing Team, uh, along with myself, uh, went round and visited uh, a number of premises in Colderdale, including Seven Days Mini Market, and that was on Wednesday the 23rd of December last year. Uh, upon entering the premises, um, one of the Trading Standards officers um, <coughs> identified himself to the lawn mail who was working in the shop at the time, a, a gentleman called Dilwa Kidia. Um, he was working at the premises and explained, and it was explained to him the reason for the visit. Uh, and officers basically then secured the premises and commenced a search uh, in order to look for counterfeit uh, goods, in particular cigarettes. Uh, during the search of the premises, uh, at the rear of the shop, uh, a large quantity of illegal tobacco products was recovered from a wall concealment at the top of the cellar steps. Um, I think you may all have a pack with the exhibits in there showing the photographs that were taken at the time as exhibits JC1, which is a photograph of the closed concealed unit next to the light switch. And JC2 is a photograph of the open concealed unit containing counterfeit cigarettes with a light switch still in view. And then JC3 is photographs of the counterfeit cigarettes that were uh, actually recovered and bagged up. Um, <clears throat> there were some other products as well that were located in a storeroom which was to the rear of the shop and adjacent to this uh, concealed unit. Um, just to give you an idea of the uh, actual unit involved, it was a, a concealed unit within the sort of uh, depth of the wall, which had quite a sophisticated locking mechanism, which consisted of two screws which were situated close together in the um, wall behind the unit, uh, and that was at the top of the cellar steps. Uh, the screws were wired to an electromagnetic locking unit holding the concealed um, door closed. Uh, and then at the top of the solid steps, we located a fork which um, had been adapted so that the two outer prongs were bent. And when these were placed uh, next to the two screws, which were the same width as the fork prongs, it then completed the circuit for the um, the concealed unit and the door then opened uh, within the wall, uh, which was actually uh, you know inside the shop effectively. Um, when the door opened, obviously that revealed that there were um, <coughs> cigarettes stored within the wall, quite a large amount, as uh, I think you can see that on the exhibit uh, JC2, uh, it should be. Um, then during the visit on the 23rd of December as well, it was also noted that the premises licence wasn't on display within the shop. Um, I spoke with Mr Kadia, who was working in the shop at the time, who managed to get hold of the licence holder, Mr uh, Taha, 
uh, and I spoke with him on the phone. Mr. Taha at the time was in Leicester and said that he, uh, he would be travelling back up shortly, but he couldn't come to the premises at that time. Um, <clears throat> and then basically uh, we, we located the uh, cigarettes, uh, as I say, within the concealed unit, some within the storeroom, which led to a flat above the shop. Um, and then um, those were bagged up and we left the premises uh, shortly after that. Uh, and those basically are the circumstances on the day. Whoa, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if I've made my microphone any better or if it's still just as difficult to hear. Um, Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for your report, Matthew. Um, I was quite interested uh, and intrigued by some of the intricacies within this. I'll invite members to ask any questions first, or if the councillors feel like I'll start having it. No? Chair, if I can come in to question on Matthew. Mm. Matthew, in your findings, I take it from what you described, there were three areas that you located um, cigarettes that were of substandard. Uh, I can't hear you. You are muted. Sorry, yeah, I'm muted. Um, there were two areas. There was one at the top of the cellar steps, which um, was at the back of the shop. Yeah. Um, and that was where the electromagnetic unit, concealed unit, was located. Um, and then it, Sort of as you looked at that face on to your left hand side, there was a door which led to a flat above the premises. Yeah. Um, and like a little storeroom area, stroke entrance area, you'd call it. There were some cigarettes located inside there as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, entry was forced through that by the um, trading standards officers to get to those. Yeah. And that gave access to the premises upstairs as well, which is a flat above. Right. There were, no, there were no no cigarettes found in the flat above, just within the sort of shop and just within right. that door next to the concealed unit. Right. Uh, did you give a estimated figure of what was the amount or quantity that was being held? Um, I don't have it, to be fair. Um, as I said, there's photos of the... Um, the amount of cigarettes that were recovered from there, the actual numbers I don't know uh, off the top of my head, to be fair. Um, but obviously, there's quite a large quantity there. It was more a case of sort of packing them up in the bags and, and sort of moving on because we had quite a few premises to uh, to visit on that day in question. Right. Okay. So is there, in the regulations, in terms of the license holder, is there any specific requirements of how quickly can the license holder arrive at the premises if required? No, um, not as such. Um, obviously, the license holder, Mr. Taha, is also the DPS at the uh, premises as well. Uh, he owns the shop, as, as, as far as I know, uh, I'm led to believe. Um, so he owns the shop. He um, is a license holder for the shop. Is the DPS, which is the designated premises supervisor. Um, and the... Um, licensing Act does say that the designated premises supervisor should make themselves available uh, as and when requested by um, an interested part, a responsible authority, shall we say. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Mr. Taha, to, to be fair to him, he said he was down in Leicester and to come up from Leicester would have taken him at least two hours, you would think, to travel. Uh, so he was unable to attend on the day in question, although I did ask him on the phone if he uh, if he could, but as I say, he did say he was in Leicester. And obviously we had other uh, shops to visit at that time, so we, we didn't have the time really to be waiting around with the resources involved for two hours for Mr. Taha to come up. Yeah. And, and um, on this occasion that you all did a visit, has there been any previous visits undertaken to these premises in the past? Um, not that I'm aware of, only the one on the 14th of December, uh, and that was a result of intelligence that was received by Trading Standards that the, uh, uh, the shop, along with other shops within Calderdale, were potentially selling counterfeit cigarettes. So they conducted test purchase operations within uh, a number of premises in Calderdale. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Thank you, Councillor Peeler. Um, Matthew, I was, oh, go ahead, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering, is, is the licence holder away from the premises um, a substantial amount of time? Or, or is he not normally in Leicester? Is he normally near I, um, I don't think he's normally in Leicester. His home address is in Huddersfield, so he's not a million miles away. Um, having read his statement, he suggests that obviously uh, the gentleman we spoke to on the day, Dilwa Kadir, uh, was the person who was running the shop as such. But Mr. Taha, being the license holder and the designated premises supervisor, has yes. overall responsibility yes. and should know what's going on within his shop. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. If I can I come back. If I can come back for one more chair. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, in terms of Mr. Taha, is his name, I take it. Um, was he aware of, of the consignment of uh, cigarettes that was present in his premises? Um, he says not. No. Um, he, uh, in his evidence, he's laying the blame firmly at the door of uh, Dilwa Kadir, who works at the shop saying that he was a rogue employee and that he was the one who was concealing the cigarettes and potentially selling them. Chair, if you don't mind, if I just want to probe this a little bit further, if Mr. Taha is the license holder and he's not aware of the contents of what's in his premises, then therefore I take it that he's failed in his duties. I would say so personally, yeah, that, that his duty as designated premises supervisor is that he should have overall responsibility for the running of the shop. Yes. And yeah, okay, you know, he, he's blaming it on a rogue employee, um, but he should know what's going on and how the business has been operated on a daily basis, really. Um, and, you know, the fact that he says he didn't know it was going on, to my mind, um, he should know what's going on. He owns the premises, he's a license holder, and he's a premises supervisor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just one um, other thing, and that is um, presumably the license holder does inspect his accounts every week, and he might have noticed a, a reduction in sales of cigarettes in the... the um, in, in the income that he received from that, presumably, because he's, they're being sold at half the price. So, you know, you wouldn't have the same turnover. Perhaps he thought everyone was giving up smoking. That's potential, although, um, you know, speaking trading standards, you'll deal with this on a more regular basis, uh, potential for turnover, albeit, it would be a legal turnover and probably wouldn't be declared is far in excess of what you would get from legal grit, shall we say. I would just, uh, on, just briefly on that point, Chair, um, we don't have any evidence from um, the license officer or the licensee, so anything in that specific regard would be pure speculation, Chair. Okay, thank you, sir. As always, a um, couple of questions, Matthew. One, um, part of the, of the application from a Shortshire police seems to relate to the potential link to organised criminality. Um, I was particularly interested in the um, perhaps more complex than usual um, hiding compartment, and I wondered if that is consistent with organised criminality or if this is something that is quite standard. The electromagnetic contraption which was um, concealing the cigarette. Yeah, um, you, you're quite difficult to, to hear, to be fair, but um, what we've found is, um, certainly in my experience, and it's, it's relatively um, short experience time that I've been dealing with this kind of thing, but um, we, we have found a number of premises that have concealed units. Um, there is a premises within Calderdale that we did uh, search once where they had con cigarettes concealed. Um, 
and because they were caught out, we, we have visited them since, and they've found another way, it would appear, of um, supplying the cigarettes without concealing them within the shop. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, as I say, from from the information I've gotten from speaking with trading standards in relation to this, it is, uh, you know, uh, lucrative, uh, is the sale of uh, counterfeit cigarettes. Um, obviously, it is organised criminality. Um, the risks involved, uh, the, certainly the financial rewards far outweigh the risks involved in relation to it. Um, uh, you know, and uh, the suggestion is that obviously the counterfeit goods are, are brought in from abroad. Um, to all intents and purposes, looking at the packaging and the way that the concealed is a very professional uh, setup, the way they do it all. The Shelley um, quantified evidence um, in respect of that last point is in page 32. So um, um, Matt has been helpful, but the I think it's important to point out that the quantified points on, on that or in the, in the statement from the trading standards officer, uh, Jason Lee Bethel. Finding the order, so just put to here at points. I am going to rejoin the meeting. But um, first, I would invite um, the African Tradesman, and I do, I hope I'm getting your name right, Niaz Raoult. It is, yes, it's Niaz. Niaz, okay, yes. nice to meet you. The meeting. Um, I'll, uh, I'll pass over to you to present your, um, or your African case, um, or the defendant case, case. Uh, 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 Thank you very much, uh, uh, Councillor Sutherland, um, if I might begin, um, uh, the background to the license or the shop is that this particular uh, shop had a, a Z premises license since early 2000, um, and to my understanding, um, has not had any issues. Uh, Mr. Taha took over the business in approximately 2018, um, and again today there haven't been any issues other than, from my understanding. Um, the um, the incident of the December 2000 sorry 14th of December uh, subsequent to, to that I believe it was um, was it 23rd of December um, to begin with um, as I've gone through the the statement of training standards um, and the others who attended um, there is no criticism to the shop in so far as its layout so if we go to um, the crux of um, what's required to hold the premises, license. Um, these uh, relate to specific conditions uh, and other things, and none of those conditions um, which uh, the applicant um, has to adhere to uh, were fail, had failed or, or looked like it failed, other than uh, the showing of, I believe, a premises license uh, certificate um, or sign um, within the shop. Uh, to my understanding, I believe uh, Mr. Taha had already made a complaint um, to the council that he hadn't received it. And I believe that issue has since been resolved and that the council have um, sent back out a copy of that premise license. So in, in, in the grand scheme of things, it, for me, it, it, I believe that the only issue that uh, could be found with this particular premises is, is the fact that illicit tobacco was appeared to have been sold. So that's the first thing. Uh, and I hope that uh, goes some way in reflecting that um, this is a legitimate business. Um, it's a legitimate community business, um, and as, as, can, as has been seen from the, the layout of the shop, a um, substantial amount of money has been spent on um, ensuring that its products are, are neatly kept, um, CCTV, for example, etc. cetera. Um, insofar as the conduct of the um, license holder, um, I'm not aware of any issues that um, the local authority or uh, the police have had. Um, to the contrary, my understanding is Mr Taha, uh, and his shop have always cooperated with the police in uh, local investigations, which um, I believe they've, they've thanked him for in the past, given that he has um, good quality CCTV, which he has himself paid for, um, which also spans out to the, the shop front. Um, so 
going towards the, um, we move on to the issues or um, what I would call um, the three areas which have been highlighted in the application. Um, these are the prevention of crime and disorder, uh, public safety and the protection from children and harm. Um, and what I really want to drill down in, um, in, in today's hearing is um, whether removing Mr. Taha's um, premises license would actually achieve uh, and improve those particular three key areas. Um, our position is that removing the premises license would not, um, as I said before, uh, or Mr. Tar's application, the business does um, profit considerably from the sale of alcohol, not tobacco. Tobacco is a peripheral product that is sold in the business, but it's certainly not something that generates huge masses of income. I believe Mr. Taha in his statement uh, explained that uh, a page in his statement that uh, 30 to 40 percent of his trade is from alcohol. So removing the premises license um, is not just would not just be a means to how do we put it prevent um, the illicit sale of tobacco, which is what has caused this, but it would also prevent Mr. Taha from being able to sell alcohol which in turn would have a detrimental effect, not only to uh, the local community in that um, he just not, would not be able to trade, but it would also have a detrimental effect to staff in that. Um, staff have come forward um, and confirmed um, the takings that they're aware of the significant amount of um, turnover that is that's achieved via alcohol sales. Um, and I just go back again um, to the conditions. Um, none of those conditions have been breached. Um, uh, asking for ID, um, ensuring that safe levels or certain levels of alcohol volume are sold, um, the, the, the pricing of that alcohol, um, higher level of alcohol volume is sold from behind the actual counter to prevent, um, to make it more difficult to be accessed and also the pricing is obviously substantially higher. Um, now, I believe it was... Um, Chris Riley, who kindly um, interjected earlier on when he mentioned that uh, we have to be careful um, of speculation um, and we have to, and, and I completely agree with what, what um, Mr. Riley said there, we have to look at the facts of this case. And the facts are that on a date, being the 14th of December, um, there it was witnessed that illicit tobacco was sold. And a second visit on the 23rd of December, uh, illicit tobacco was sold. And what's interesting about this, and I, and I speak on the facts here, are that on both times, um, the individual who sold that tobacco um, was, is, is the same person. Further to that, on both those times, he was the only person in the shop. So um, nobody else witnessed that, um, as would be expected if anybody had been around him. Um, and again, the statements of the staff confirm they've never seen the, the sale of illicit tobacco, neither has the premises license holder. Um, interestingly enough, um, the application that came forward, which is obviously made public, um, nobody within the community has come forward to say they are aware of illicit tobacco, which speaks volumes uh, considering the time that was made available uh, and the signage that was posted outside the shop. Um, hundreds, if not thousands of people passed by that shop. Uh, on a daily basis um, and yet we have multiple statements who um, strongly support the, the, the shop, the premises and the, and, um, the keeping of that premises license. Um, if I go to some of the statements in here, I'm just going to pick out a few examples of some of the statements that have been made by some of the, um, the locals. Uh, we have, for example, somebody saying, um, I have never witnessed disorder or anything untoward to children. Somewhere else in somebody else's, it says, um, I myself am a tenant of nearly 12 months who uses my local shop every day, maybe three times a day. Um, I suspect they you wanted to use the word I, but they said, hasn't seen any wrongdoing, only what they do a daily living. And they go further than that to say, I personally can say whilst I've been in my local shop, the staff have always been alert with ID, et cetera, et cetera. They ask for ID if they think any person looks underage. It's another comment that somebody else has made. Uh, another person has said, it is close, referring to the premises, the actual shop, it is close for myself and having arthritis, I cannot carry heavy things for um, uh, 
thought so the location of the shop is ideal um there is no reason to expect any children are at harm of purchasing goods from the shop so this is just a snapshot of the, the many um residents or locals of the shop who actually expressed their concern not one person i repeat has said they've ever witnessed or aware of any illicit tobacco sales uh that coupled with the fact that on two times the shop was only occupied or ran by mr dilwa at the time um that in um so at that point also um is raised by Mr. Taha in his statement. And what's interesting is that Dilwa occupied the flat above, which um, um, Trading Stand was in the police confirmed is where they actually found uh, a significant amount of the tobacco. Now, if I draw your attention to the actual layout of the shop, um, I believe it's in the actual uh, combined document, uh, I believe it's earlier on uh, at page nine, of the document um, and if you look to the bottom of that page um, I can take my time if anybody wants me to slow down for them to give them opportunity to look at that page or can I continue I'll continue until some unless somebody says they want me to slow down but um, in that particular document which is put together on page nine there is a there's a layout of the shop um, and as can be seen from the bottom of the shop where it says pedestrian foot where you can see the entrance into the shop now I'm going to try and give you guys a uh, an idea of how um, access to the flat is, which is where we say Dilwa occupied. What you would do is you go through the door and take a left. Um, so you go to the end and take a left. And as you can see, there's a door to the end, which then goes back around itself to the left. And there's a 180 degree right down to the bottom. Uh, on the left, it says storage. And at the bottom, it says raised area comprising, comprised with three stairs. That's the entrance to the flat. So what we have within close proximity of each other is a flat which has been closed and shut to um, not only the premises license holder, but also staff and the public. And then you've got a very smart concealed storage part, which is where the illicit tobacco was also found. Um, there, is, there was no CCTV there. And, and, and what our view is that the individual who was caught selling the tobacco has himself um, in his own time, bearing in mind that he did close the shop um, on an evening, um, uh, cause the storage to, um, or, or create this compartment holding the illicit tobacco uh, and further hold more of it within his own flat. Um, that isn't something that is, um, that is, is impossible. Uh, and on the facts, um, I go again back to this point, an initial, uh, test was done, it was the same person, Dilwa, by himself. A subsequent person, done, it was again this individual by himself. So um, these points in themselves are what we hope um, are facts which are, are, are used and, and taken into consideration um, by, by the board um, and speculation isn't actually taken. Um, whilst they accept, I think Mr. Tarr accept, accepts, it doesn't look good. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he is guilty of it. Um, he hasn't been found guilty of a crime. I suspect he wouldn't be found guilty of a crime um, in both the civil side on the balance of, of probabilities, given the statements of both the community or, or many members of the community, his own staff, uh, and also to some extent the the, um, the statements of the police and training standards, which, which some to some extent go on to actually corroborate Mr. Taha's version of events. Um, from a criminal perspective, um, nothing has been raised, um, not to say nothing can't be raised, but again, um, I suspect that um, the facts are what, what even a police investigation would be looked at. Um, and our view is that there isn't enough evidence to, to, to there wouldn't be enough evidence to prosecute uh, because firmly there, there, is, there will be no evidence. Mr. Ha Taha had no engagement. Now, what's interesting also to know is a reference to organized crime and, and um, th those words, from speaking with Star has have caused a certain amount of distress and anxiety given the uh, connotations to that. That's quite serious terminology, serious and organized crime. Mr. Taha, even in his own statement, denies that vehemently. Um, and I have no reason I've seen anything, I've not seen anything to believe um, to the contrary. Um, if I may go back to um, 
the three points in that case. And if um, the, the panel, the board, take the view that it could be, uh, and it is the case that Mr Taha was not involved, did not know about this, as didn't his staff, as did not the community, um, then we have to ask ourselves, would removing the premises license actually um, have any effect on the prevention of crime, public safety or protection from children, children harm? And we would say it wouldn't because if Mr Taha has no involvement in that, then what exactly are we, what, what exactly are we supporting? Um, the, the issue that uh, transpired on both days, we believe has, um, has been cut out now. Uh, to some extent, we've gone beyond that and we've actually included, um, or, or sorry, Mr Taha has installed further CCTV cameras within the actual shop. And I go back to the actual um, storage facility in that diagram at page nine, um, and where you can see um, on the far left, the, um, in the corner storage, and there's an arrow where it says raised comprising area, and there's an arrow going from the raised area forwards. That long line, right at the top of that line, which is sort of going at a two o'clock, a new piece of CCTV, a new CCTV camera has been installed. And that's simply to ensure that as best we can, we prevent or limit any member of staff in the future from having any idea to potentially hide or conceal um, illicit tobacco or, or illicit alcohol or anything illicit to that, to that effect. So these are further steps that have been taken uh, by the premises license holder to try to demonstrate that they are doing what they can. Um, just going back to um, um, one of the individual uh, councillor, uh, Chris Pillai, uh, if I may, um, was his question on um, the regulations. Um, and I agree with Mr. Dal Matthew Dalton, who kindly confirmed that um, Mr. Taha uh, did, uh, did confirm that he was willing to cooperate with them. Um, there isn't a specific time scale, um, uh, but Mr. Taha was willing to cooperate, I believe, from uh, Mr. Taha's statement and also with an application that when asked, uh, Mr. Taha gave full permission for them to search the premises. Uh, this isn't somebody who, who has anything to hide. Um, and so uh, I asked the, the board in the hearing to, to effectively take into consideration these points um, and I hope make the right decision, which is to um, let the premises license uh, holder keep that premises license. Thank you. Thank you, please, Chairman. Um, can I, can I, Chair, um, can I just ask Niles a question, please? Yep. Sorry. Niles, I'm from College Council Legal Services. I'm the lawyer that advises the Chair. Um, you've addressed specifically and only um, to the Chair why the licence shouldn't, shouldn't be revoked. The options which are outlined on page three, there are actually five options, but you wish to include any reference to the, the previous four options, which the, the councillors have. Um, if, if we go through them, so the first option is modifying the conditions, either permanently or for a period not exceeding three months. Um, I have to be completely honest here. Um, and my, my personal opinion uh, and the opinion of Mr Taha in the same respect is that what would be achieved by, um, for example, um, um, revoking the licence for a period um, of three months, um, what, what would actually be achieved? Um, and, and we would say not very much. Um, that's the first thing. And so far as exclude a licensable activity from the scope of the license um, permanently or for a period, again, what would be achieved? We, we look at the statements of the local community and uh, a number of statements have come forward Challenge 25 has come forward. Uh, this is all public safety. This is all protection from children from harm. This is all prevention of crime dis disorder. None of these are in question. Um, if we carve out the two issues or the two um, parts of this case, which are 
the, the, the events happened on the 13th and 23rd, which we say are completely rogue. And then we say suspend the license for uh, uh, the, the second part is remove the designated presbyter's supervisor where evidence has been submitted, sorry, submitted, uh, which leaves members to consider that the problems at the premises are the result of poor management. Now, at this stage, whilst it's accepted that um, Mr. Taha wasn't aware of it, the circumstances, if taken in totality, would indicate that these, this is a fairly clever way to conceal and certainly be done at times when the only way you would actually be able to spot this is if you were monitoring the CCTV. And that's just not possible. It's not possible by Superdrug, by Tesco, by any small convenience store. Um, I go back to the point, which was that um, the individual, the, the, we call him the rogue employee, did solely elicit tobacco, was found to sell tobacco at times when no other members of staff were there. And there are times when there are two or three members of staff there. Um, there are many times Mr. Tahar does work from there as well. Um, he does frequent um, other business which he has, which is he sells vehicles. Um, but majority of his time is spent actually at the shop. Um, so um, removing him, um, or, or back to the point, is, 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 is Mr. Taha really guilty of poor management? And, and our argument is no, because the circumstances or the facts of how these sales have been traded clearly show that this is some. This was somebody who was determined to sell the tobacco, um, and, and and has concealed it in a way where it would just not have been possible, uh, but for monitoring the CCTV twenty four seven or being at the site twenty four seven. And that is something that just no premises license is probably is, is, would be able to do unless they were there full time. Um, D suspend the license for a period not exceeding three months or revoke the license. Again, I think in Mr. Taha's view, um, these are fairly draconian uh, penalties. Uh, now, what I would say is, um, and it doesn't appear to be a, a condition there, is that in the event a further uh, uh, breach of a test purchase is, is, uh, is found, go ahead, revoke the license. Um, absolutely revoke the license. Um, but as it stands, doing anything other than allowing Mr. Taha to continue with the license would, would, would not benefit uh, the three key areas which, which uh, the local authority are trying to, to uphold. Um, and it would certainly cause um, issues with staff in terms of their pay. And also as, as evidence in the, in the, within some stems of the community, it would cause, cause issues to the community as well. Um, so that, that's, that's my response there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. I'm noticing Matthew said that he's, um lost sound and vision. Um, we are all still in, Matthew. Someone might, but could someone reply to him in the chat or, or, or try and connect him back in if he's, if he's missing? Um, I had, um, I, I mean, my particular concern was around the appropriateness of, of, the, uh, of, the, pre of the license holder in this case. Um, I think Councillor Clark, it was who mentioned about the amount of money that could have been going through here and having just looked at the photos if there's a five pound margin on those cigarettes we're, we're talking not hundreds but thousands of pounds of illegal tobacco potentially going through the shop and um i, I think any small business owner would um be, be hard, hard hard pressed by several thousands of pounds of turnover potentially not coming through because presumably if it is a rogue employee and they're not doing it on behalf of the shop, then it is someone's coming in to buy a packet of cigarettes from the shop and instead that person is taking the money and giving them a, a counterfeit packet, which, which as Councillor Clark said, would, um, if we're talking thousands of pounds worth of tobacco being found, that is a significant um, mark on your profit line. And uh, the reason that would concern me is how it relates to the wider standards. So if, the, if, the, if we're not keeping... Uh, or if so, such a potentially large financial um, line could sl slip through, it's just about the how standards are maintained across all other areas, including um, in, uh, underage um, sale of alcohol. If it was so easy for a rogue employee to um, have got away with such a potentially large financial um, fraud against the shop, it's just about how does the license holder, if he's not present very often, ensure that any of the other standards are being maintained 
Um, do, do, can, can I interject, mm. Councillor Sutherland? Yeah. Um, so to begin with, um, I think it would be incorrect to suggest that he doesn't, he, he, he's, he's not there often, and that isn't the case. Um, secondly, um, in so far as my understanding from illicit tobacco goes, um, from experience of dealing with these types of hearings and, and seeing evidence that we've put forward um, previously, um, there isn't actually, they, they don't sell the tobacco for the same price as what they would sell the, the, the normal tobacco. Mm -hmm. So what they would do is they buy it cheap and sell it cheap. Um, the purpose behind illicit tobacco is because the consumer does not want to pay the full price of the tobacco. And, and that's really, whilst there is the, the driving force behind, we call it the, the criminal or the, that criminal intent, is to make money. Um, it's driven by consumers or customers who are wanting to pay cheap prices. And from my understanding, um, a, a packet of 20 uh, bench and hedges can, I think it's well in excess, I think, just under 15 pounds now um uh, between 10 and 15 pounds is usually the average place or 12 to 15 pounds for a, for a pack of 20 which is very expensive considering i think maybe 15 20 years ago it was probably about four or five pounds for a packet of 20 now the same packet of 20 illegal tobacco uh, illicit tobacco sells for uh, from my experience and from evidence that i've seen before uh, anything between three uh, and, and four pounds a packet so um, in terms, so far as volume, um, I, based on what I've seen in terms of the actual tobacco that was found, that that's not even that won't even push tens of thousands just just on that tobacco there. From what, what I could see, it may do, but it certainly won't go anywhere near the hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, and that kind of corroborates the, the our version, which is this is somebody who has always tr has tried to make potentially a side income here from the side here. Um, in so far as what can we do, um, what kind of example do we set? Um, this isn't a typical scenario. This isn't somebody who's been found to have sold. This isn't somebody who has a shop where somebody has said they are consistently selling tobacco. Um, what's happened is somebody has tipped off, um, if that's what's happened. Um, and the days that have come in, um, it's, as we use the word, a rogue employee. It's not something that has happened before. Again, we would have expected at this point for statements to come forward to suggest that there is some something. Um, the, the, the people here in, in the statements, um, I mean, I'm, I'm unsure whether um, members or anybody watching will know the area, but it is a very, the demographic of that area is it's, um, it's, it's um, a fairly poor area. And you would think that in an area like that, it would be rife with people knowing that cheap tobacco has been sold. Some of the statements confirm that they purchase items like that. Um, these people are willing to and do pay full price, that means. Okay, thank you very much for that. I had one other question that you may be able to answer or perhaps one of the other officers might be able to otherwise. We've got, we've got two separate incidents here, um, not very long between the two. Um, I, want, I wondered when the premises holder was first made aware. Was it after the first incident or was it after the second? So my understanding is it's after the second, if anybody would, uh, wants to, to, to clarify that. Yeah, as, as far as I'm aware, um, it was after the second incident. So... so uh, yeah. I'm 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 Jason from Trading Standard. Sorry about I, I I was late joined, had technical difficulties. Yeah. The test purchase was, was, was purely covert. No nobody was informed of it. It was just to give us an idea if the shop was selling um and, and where the, the illegal tobacco was being stored in the shop. Um so nobody was told then it was on after we'd done the visit that the, the license holder was was informed. Okay. Thank you for that, Jason, and welcome to the meeting. So to better so for my better understanding, the first meeting was a covert meet uh, the first incident was a covert incident. Um, and note then the license holder and the premises weren't made aware at this time, but then a follow-up incident is where um, the more deep search happened and the license holder was told. That's correct, yeah. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, members, do we have any um, questions to the applicant's agent? Councillor Pillai? Thank you. Um, I didn't catch uh, Mr Niaz's um, role in this exercise. Um, can you explain who you are, please? Uh, I'm representing Mr Taha. Yeah, um, thank you. Now, is Mr. Taha present with you today? He isn't now. 
No, he isn't. And he's aware of today's hearing being undertaken by the local authority? He is aware, correct. And he understands his role as a license holder? He does, yes. Yes, because he would have been explained all of those in the initial period when he applied for a license. Correct. And, and he would have been known his role and his functions. And you also did elude that Mr. Taha has worked in the shop on a couple of occasions with other staff members. So surely as a license holder and as a worker on the shop floor, he must have known there were concealed spaces within the staircase area. That's no total not. denial on that one. Uh, from, the, from the imagery that was taken, um, this is, I, I don't want to use the word sophisticated, but it was certainly in a way which was would not be apparent to anybody who would walk mm -hmm. past it, mm -hmm. given it was the, the trunking uh, was effectively prized open um, to, I don't know whether it was plaster or whatever was behind, but yeah. effectively was split off and the trunking was used to conceal the actual, um, how the, the, the yeah. point opened and closed. Okay. I'm just purely narrowing down. Mr. Mr. Taha has been present on the premises. He has worked in the shop. And I think as an owner of the property, he would have had a good idea of what areas of his property exercises. And he would have gone down the staircase or up the staircase, whichever it might be, and would have looked at all these. And I'm sure there must have been a, a good understanding of what was going on. I mean, we're bordering speculation here in terms of no, suggesting not, that he I'm was aware of speculation. As a magistrate, I'll tell you what I listened to. Uh, look, I, I, res I, I respect your view and I respect your opinion on that, Councillor Pillai. Um, but Mr. Taha is adamant that he was not aware of it, and, and, and it's as simple as that. Neither are his staff. We have two other members of staff who confirm that they were aware of it. The fine, which, which is the, the repercussions of um, Mr. Taha lying here are fairly considerable. Um, and that spans not only to him, but also uh, to staff who come forward and supported him and said that they don't, those staff have been in the shop multiple times for mm -hmm. hours, um, long hours on end. And um, whilst even working with the individual in question, Mr. Dilwa, and haven't seen anything like that. So our position is Mr. Dilwa has conducted these sales in a fairly covert way. Um, not only that, he, owned, he, he occupied the flat upstairs. There was no way to see the stash that was hidden behind. Yeah. Okay, I, I know you, you've mentioned Mr. Taha was not aware and he was not totally in control of his, pres his premises, I will say, uh, under the Licensing Act. And uh, I, 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 I disagree that he was not in control. Um, how do you define not being in control? The, the, the Licensing Act, I believe that the, the, um, the local authorities, a legal advisor will be there uh, or, or, or is here and he'll um, be able to confirm um, what the, um, uh, the requirements are of, of, of a premises license are. Um, they don't say you have to be there 24 seven and you actually do have a certain, you are expected to be able to, or to, to, to manage it properly. And you're expected to be aware of what's going on. Um, Mr. Taha not being there doesn't mean that he doesn't know what's going on. Mr. Taha not being there doesn't, doesn't mean that he um, is, is, um, is, is below the threshold of a premises license holder. Um, just like in any or many other premises license, the designate the, the, the designated or the premises license holder uh, or designated supervisor, they don't always have to be there and they are not always there. Um, it's quite common. How often is um, Mr. Taha present at the shop? F from my understanding, he's there anything between three to six days a week. Okay. That's quite a lot to not notice anything. Well, staff are there equally the same, um, but no member of staff has come forward, is, is, is what we would say. Um, no, no, no member of the community has come forward to suggest it. You would expect in these circumstances at least a member, somebody, would, at least one person in the community would say, I am aware, or I have seen, or I have purchased something. Not a single person has. Okay. Um... Yeah. 
Uh. So, Councillor, can I just make a quick comment there regarding the hide, the concealment? Mm, please do. Um, just to say that it's a very specialist technical bit of kit. It isn't something the average person can fit. Mm. Um, it's a specialist electronic um, person. You need to fit these things. Um, it, it requires, you know, to make circuits within the wall, electromagnetics that, that are operated remotely. It's a very special technical. You know, to say that somebody's fitted it, you know, just works in the shop without knowledge, it isn't believable, to be honest. Um, I know that the organised criminal gangs that run, that run several shops sort of thing have specialist teams they bring in to, to fit these concealments within the shop. And they require a pr prolonged period of time and quite, good, you know, a good um, experience, really, to make them blend in with the shop. Uh, and it was totally covertly blended in. A really professional job had been done on it, if I can just add that. Yeah, according to Mr. Tarr, it'd be absolutely ludicrous for him to, it'd be absolutely ludicrous for, uh, to, to, he had absolutely no, from, from his statements, from everybody else, he has absolutely no knowledge. As before, this individual who worked there, worked there, he closed the shop, he had access to the flat, he, he, he worked, not hard for him to do. In fact, I, I do, in fact, one point I think we have raised is um, we, uh, my understanding is um, damage has been done to, uh, further damage has been caused to that area to ensure that it isn't done again. Whilst I suspect nothing will be done again, especially in light of the fact that more CCTV cameras have been set up. One thing I'm, I'll bring you in in a second, Chris. One thing I'm struggling with is that there's, there's sort of two lines of argument here. One that the the license holder was was so unaware that it's that it's almost not their their fault and it's a rogue individual, but that they've also they're present enough and they've got the skills and the appropriate personality to be able to to run a shop. So it seems to be sort of a, a, a twin track argument that goes in two different directions here about whether someone is fit proper on site often enough and doing appropriate checks to make sure that this or any other illegal activity is going on and all the licensing objectives are being fulfilled, or we have someone who has such a, a lack of knowledge, perhaps, about what's going on in their shop that, you know, someone's been able to install sophisticated equipment within the premises and operate a business that potentially runs into the thousands selling tobacco. So it's it kind of goes both ways in terms of um, the license holder for me, whether, whether it's ignorance or they really are someone who is in control of a premises. I, 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 I completely agree with what you're saying, and on, on the face of it, I, I, I have to accept that it, it, it doesn't look good. Um, but the facts are there, and I think we have to um, just bring it back to legal advice. We have to really steer ourselves with what the facts are um, and what evidence has been has presented, um, combined with um, uh, the statements, um, the, report, the, the comments of the community as well. Um, and whether or not removing this would actually um, be of any benefit given um, in light of this. We are speculating that he had involvement because if he'd done three to six days a week, he should have known. Um, as in statements, um, it's, 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 you don't, some staff work there alone. Um, some staff work there, two, three of them at a time. Um, so these, these, these have to be considered. But I do appreciate exactly what you're saying, Councillor Sutherland. Thank you. I'm going to bring Councillor Peel in and then I see Councillor Clark's got a question. Yeah, then... thank you, Chair. Um, two straightforward answers. Is the rogue um, individual still employed by this gentleman? No. Right. And secondly, um, Mr. Taha is in the premises now, I take it. I uh, no, he's not in the, as in when you say, as in physically as we speak? Physically, when I say. Oh, as he works in the, yes, he's working. In... He's working in the premises license, yes. And but, thirdly, the statements that you've got in your hand from the local committee, have you submitted those to our licensing team? Yes. Right. In, I, I, I'm, I'm slightly conscious that I don't think all of them have been scanned in, um, but of the half a dozen that I can see, um, they, 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 they actually form part of the bundle. Um, I believe there may have been some pages missing, but um, the gist of, of um, the comments are certainly there. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can, I, can I go back to when the test purchase was, was made? 
Um, were the cigarettes that were then sold to the tester, were they obtained from where cigarettes are normally obtained, i.e. behind a screen, or were they in a special place that they were obtained from? Does, does anyone know that? Um, I do. I can answer that, um, Councillor. The, the, the person working in the shop went to the area out of view where the hide had been installed um, at the base of the stairs, basically. So it's a, it, it, it's a resumption, but he probably got them out of the hide, which was just out of view of the counter. OK. And what? Um, so he left the counter, which yeah. has all, all the cigarettes behind it, presumably. I think there's okay. a genuine sales. Yes, yes. Yeah. Did he say why he had to go to... No, place. no. When, when when cheap cigarettes were asked for, he, he just went to that area um, and came back with them, basically. Thank you. No, I was I was just wondering if they if they were stashed in in the normal place where cigarettes are kept in a in a shop, that which would implicate that people behind the counter, whoever they were, knew about it. But if if it was if they were taken from another place, that makes it may maybe maybe less likely that the other staff did about it. Yeah. Uh, could I could I come in? Yeah. It's Matthew Dalton, please. Uh, just in relation to, I appreciate Mr. Taha is not present, but when we actually went to the premises and spoke to Dilwar Kadia, I appreciate that the uh, submission. From Mr. Taha and Mr. Ralph is that uh, Dilwa lives in the flat above the shop, but he actually gave Mr. Taha's home address in Huddersfield as his address when we spoke with him on the day. Um, and obviously, Mr. Taha also mentions that he uh, has employed Mr. Kadia for about eight months and has lived in the flat above. Uh, and from police records, uh, I'm aware that. Uh, Mr. Kadir was convicted of an offence in January 2019 when he had a vehicle registered to uh, uh, Mr. Taha's home address in Huddersfield. So that's two years ago, <clears throat> which just might have some bearing on how well they know each other and uh, how much information they might share between themselves. <clears throat> Thank you, Matthew. So the relationship goes beyond the period we were initially looking at. And just to confirm, following what Councillor Clark was asking, in terms of when you did find um, illegal tobacco, was it just in the in the hide sort of space, or was, it, was there any tobacco anywhere else within? The uh, it was in the hide. There was there was some, as I say, as you looked at the hide to the left hand side. There's a door that led to the flat above. Uh, Jason will probably tell you better, uh, but the forced entry to that because uh, Mr. Kadir said that he didn't have keys for the flat. Um, <clears throat> and so entry was forced because they could see, I think, some cigarettes under the door as they could hear through, you know, in the gaps under the door. Um, and that was what caused him to go in there. And there was some recovered from in there, but the vast, the, the main quantity was from the hide uh, within the shop itself. Um, and as I said, we went up into the flat, searched the flat. There was nothing in the flat other than at the bottom of the stairs next to the shop. Um, so, uh, and again, just from the, the amount of time Mr. Taha spends there, when I spoke with him on the phone, he did actually say that he'd been at the shop the previous night because there were some questions in relation to some other property that was found at the uh, premises in the cellar, but that was another issue, to be fair. <clears throat> Um, so yeah, as I say, you know, there's some inconsistencies with his, uh, certainly the, the, the indication I've got from the submissions from Mr. Taha is that he's known Mr. Kadir for eight months, but from the information I've got, it would tend to suggest that he's known him longer. But obviously Mr. Taha isn't here to ask that question because that was a question I was potentially, uh, waiting to ask him how long he'd actually known him, um. And I've, I've no doubt Mr. Ralph can't actually answer that question, I wouldn't think. From, from my understanding, sorry, if, if we just go back to the eight months, I believe what you're referring to is the time at which Mr. 
Dilwa worked there, not. And I think. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I get that. I mean, he, he has said that he's worked there eight months and he lived in the flat above, uh, yeah. which leaves it a little bit open ended. But as I say, we've got on our record, police records that uh, he has given uh, Mr. Tar's home address as his home address. He had a vehicle registered to his address in 2000, January 2019. Because he was convicted uh, of speed. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the vehicle that maybe, I mean, if I j- just go on to um, the, the, the vehicle side, a vehicle being registered to an address and a vehicle ownership can actually be two different people. Um, from my understanding, a vehicle can be registered somewhere and a vehicle can be owned somewhere. Uh, my understanding is Mr. Taha did know Dilwa. I, 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 I just, I want to try to... Um, ex- get people to try and take the, the, the doubts out of this and really look at this objectively. And because, I mean, we have to, rather than looking at Mr. Taha as being the guilty party, why are we not looking at Mr. Dilwa? He, I mean, you said yourself, he has a criminal history. Um, Mr. Taha doesn't have a criminal history. Mr. Dilwa has lied. He's the one who sold the list to, to Echo. Mr. Taha hasn't ever been found of doing something like this. Mr. Taha has got no record of doing anything like this previously. So why are we, should we not be looking at Mr. Taha questioning his version of events rather than Mr. Taha's version of events? It's just a point that I, I hope he's taken into consideration. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Bill, uh, when you say he's got a criminal history, he, he, he got done for speeding in 2019. That was, that, that's the top and bottom of his criminal history, which in was, it's, it's, excessive it's not, criminality. <laughs> well, I mean, speeding doesn't constitute, um, wouldn't even go on there. <clears throat> yeah, what's he called? Sure. I don't want the hearing to go too off the mainstream into whether speeding is a crime, etc. Um, I think we need to keep well on track with the with the facts and issues of the premises without going too far off the the um, what's under consideration. Thank you, Chris. Um, and I will do that. Though I do think it is noteworthy that if there was some connection prior, that that wasn't sort of brought forward in the in the license holder statements. In I, the was, of full, that's just, of full I was just that's, I was just trying to avoid having a, a collateral issue on the um, mm. gravity of a speeding offence. Um, yes, Chris, so- you, you might be able to advise me. I was going to. Um, so, if you might be able to remind me, do we now invite the uh, the applicant, which is where Shopship to police, to ask questions of the agent and vice versa before we uh, before members retire to make their decision. Can you advise me on the process? Uh, Matthew, yes. from me, does Matthew have any questions? Um, no, I, I mean I've really I think I've, I've pointed out um, the sort of certainly the inconsistencies I see in relation to uh, the connection between. Mr. Kadir and uh, Mr. Taha uh, and their potential relationship. Because uh, as I say, yeah, Mr. Taha isn't here to answer how long he's actually known him. Uh, what I would say in relation to Mr. Rao's submissions and what he's uh, brought um, forward in relation to the local community not coming forward uh, and saying that the experience to legal tobacco, as he's expressed, uh, you know, is a working class area. Um, and uh, probably a lot of people that are unemployed, people that have a low-paid job. So buying cheap cigarettes is a temptation, surely, uh, in such circumstances. Um, and, you know, people buying cheap cigarettes, knowing that it's an illegal activity, aren't necessarily going to come forward and admit to that. Um, so, you know, that's the main thing. And And... and and just to sort of um, reiterate the fact that, you know, um, and I think I've put it in my report, but Part 11.27 of Section 182 of the Licensing Act states that the activity that may arise in connection with licensed premises which should be treated particularly seriously. And these, um, these are listed then below, one of them being for the sale and storage of smuggled tobacco and alcohol. Um, Obviously, I, you know, I think my submission is that um, there's criminal activity going on. Um, he's not really shown that he's a responsible person to hold the premises license, as Mr. Taha. Um, he should be responsible for those premises and know what's going on. And um, 
you know, he, he, the temptation is there for people to buy cheap cigarettes, which aren't regulated. They harm people's health and uh, cheap cigarettes, I would suggest as well, can attract children to come and buy cigarettes. And that's why I submitted the three objectives of the Licensing Act that uh, I feel uh, have been breached effectively. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Um, so, Niaz, I will ask, invite you to uh, offer a closing statement and ask any questions that you might have of, uh, of, of West Yorkshire Police. Thank you, Phil. Um, so, to, to summarise, really, what, what we have on one side is um, uh, the question we ask ourselves is, is there anything that gives us, is there anything within there that gives us reason to believe this individual is lying? And I submit there isn't. Um, someone's mentioned, um, it says that he knew him for eight months, um, but he doesn't say how long he knew him before. That, that, that is not something to hang somebody's character on. Um, the suggestion that he didn't know what was going on in the shop because out of two incidents, when one person was working there, um, the, list of, the, the, the incident occurred in question occurred. Two incidents we're talking about, um, and subjectively or objectively, in fact, um, they corroborate the fact that Mr. Taha, as he's maintaining his statement, says he was not aware of it. Um, it so in closing my submissions, I, I have to say, we need to look at the facts of Mr. Taha in so far as, is there anything that gives us, or is there something that gives us a reason to believe that he would be lying, that his staff would be lying? Um, what's interesting, I, I just want to bring back the point in terms of the, um, the area and that people do buy cheap tobacco. In my experience, having done and dealt with a number of these cases, it's, it's not uncommon for people in the community to, to come forward and say something wrong is going on because thankfully, um, more people than not are more concerned about children, public safety and the prevention of crime and especially those people who um, um, don't purchase it but also there are people who admit that they purchase it but they still come forward and they say I'm a purchaser and they have done in the past there are instances where people have done, done that in the past um, so um, that's just in relation to that point um, I'd ask, um, obviously, the legal advisor will have to guide you guys in so far as the, um, the legal points are on this. Um, uh, and I trust um, he'll be able to kind of uh, hopefully um, direct you guys in, in so far as what facts you have to take into consideration uh, and what we call it speculation or whatever um, may and should actually be disregarded. Um, and also, uh, I trust the legal advisor will take into consideration um, the effects uh, and whether removing the premises license will in fact achieve the objectives or better the objectives or not. Um, should the council or, or the legal advisor recommend any conditions, um, we invite conditions which um, may assist or um, encourage or improve um, the, the outlining objectives, um, but removing this premises license, as we say, is, is not something that will happen. Um, but I'll leave it to, to uh, the legal advisor to, to discuss with the rest of you. Chair, um, I, I'll just confirm to Nayas for the benefit that the legal advisor does not have any impact on the decision. I'm restricted to uh, advising on the law. The outcome is entirely um, by the, these. I just wanted to uh, tell you my clear. Um, Chair, as with all licensed matters, your parameters are to consider the four objectives of, of the licensing act. And um, that is the um, ambit. So it's a case of dovetailing the evidence and facts with the objectives on reaching a determination on whether you impose any of the five options, which are outlined clearly in page three of the report. Chair. Thank you very much for that summary, Chris. I notice Councillor Clark's got her hand up, so I'm going to go to Councillor Clark, and then I'll confirm if anybody else wants to speak before I invite members to retire and make a decision. 
thank you, Chair. I, I don't know whether this is an appropriate time to ask. It's another question to ask me as. Rev. Is that appropriate, Chris? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how often you would find the rogue employee on their own in the shop. Did we, how often did we find the rogue employee? No, not, not how did we find, how often would he be working on his own in the shop um, without others around? I haven't got confirmation of that, but my understanding based on some of the staff rotors was that it could be two days a week. Um, and usually those were the quieter, the, 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 the quiet on the quieter days. Um, but when we say two days, what, 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 sometimes happen is it's shift it's rotated it's shift rotated yeah. so a day for us isn't necessarily from morning until the evening it could be between certain hours yeah. um and miss uh, and, and that so so it's um it's also not that it could be one person for a certain part of the day another one person for the rest of the day and so on throughout the week uh, bearing in mind there's four people you had the two you had mr Taha, you also had uh, the individual who no longer works there um, and, and, and then, then Mr. Tapper says that he's there for six days a week sometimes. Uh, I, uh, well, I apologise if I've, I've used the word six in, in that context. I think what I'm, what, six days in so far as he's physically present six days. In terms of the total, your, your question was how long would Mr. Dilwa be there? In totality, um, mm -hmm. my understanding is based on the staff rotors, a total of two days in terms of uh, if you can took that in the context of full time hours. Thank you. Yeah. Could I just come in again one last time? Yep. Is that okay? Sorry. Yeah. I know it, it's, it's all relatively new to me, to be fair, is this? But I just, uh, just, just one thing as well, whilst I've just been reading my, uh, my papers and whatever. Um, just another sort of point to consider as well, perhaps, um, uh, is that uh, again back in 2019 there was uh, a premises that was um, uh, the DPS at the premises was removed initially uh, from some premises in Kirklees where they did uh, an operation with counterfeit cigarettes that were seized and the DPS at those premises was a gentleman called Omid Ali um, and again just from our inquiries at present or certainly when I uh, made the application uh, there was a vehicle registered to Mr. Omed Ali at Mr. Taha's home address, which again shows uh, potentially a connection between uh, criminality and mm -hmm. uh, illegal sale of tobacco. Okay. Thank you for that, Matthew. Um, invite, I'll invite Nias to respond if he was, wishes to, otherwise... Um, I wanted to confirm whether everybody had felt that they had the right to to speak, say everything that they wanted to say, ask any questions they wanted to ask before I take us, uh, take us to retire. Um, I, I've submitted my closing submission, so um, even on answering that, I, to, in all fairness, I haven't got a response to that. It's something I wouldn't be able to answer. Okay. Do you feel like you've said everything you wanted to say? I do, yes. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Matthew, Jason, do you, are you covered on um, your side or do you want to add anything? No, I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, I'm presuming we're all happy in terms of what we, that we've covered everything we need to cover. And now what members need to do is to retire and make a decision and hopefully come back um, to the meeting as soon as possible with that decision to inform you of, of how the discussion's gone. So um, the three the three members will uh, uh, and uh, will leave now and we will uh, rejoin this call um or I don't know if the plan is that we might mute it and turn them both off. I'm hardly doing that since I've moved from my iPad to my PC since it wasn't working before. Uh, members can turn off their microphones on Zoom and their cameras. And then I think Janet is going to resume the Teams meeting. Perfect. And I will okay. put up a, a note so the public know that we are adjourned for a little while. Okay. All right. Thank you all for your patience and we'll be back soon.
Are you back in, members?
Hi hey everybody, do we have everyone back? Who needs to be back? Yeah. I'm here, Chair. I have to be visible. Okay. Mm. Okay. Right, thank you. I am going to begin because this is um, quite a lengthy statement and we are required to read it out in full. Um, so I'll make a start now. Thank you everybody for, for waiting. I know it took quite some time to to deal with the deliberations, but uh, this has uh, 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 there's been a lot of evidence to have to consider in this case. So the unanimous resolution of the subcommittee is that having given consideration to the report presented and to representations made at the hearing, in particular having considered the serious concerns of the responsible authority, West Yorkshire Police and West Yorkshire Trading Standards in respect of the following licensing objectives, prevention of crime and disorder, protection of children from harm, public safety, and having due regard to the provisions of the Licensing Act 2003, the statutory guidance issued under Section 182 of the Act, the Council Statement of Licensing Policy, and the relevant provisions of the Human Rights Act, members resolved that the premises license for seven days, Mini Market 226 Pelham Lane, Halifax, HX1, 5RU, be revoked for the following reasons. Interested parties have put forward evidence that the following free licensing objectives are not met. Number one, prevention of crime and disorder. Two, protection of children from harm. Three, public safety. Evidence has been heard regarding the lack of supervision of staff. On Monday the 14th of December 2020, an environmental health officer visited the premises and purchased counterfeit cigarettes, whose normal retail price for the brand displayed was over £10 for £5. A subsequent visit on Wednesday, the 23rd of December 2020, with police in attendance, the premises were searched and a quantity of counterfeit and smuggled cigarettes was found to be secreted in a concealed locked enclosure. The reasons for the review arose out of serious concerns by West Yorkshire Police that the premises were being used for criminal activity. This was founded on the facts of the visits on Monday, the 14th of December 2020 and Wednesday, the 23rd of December 2020. The factual evidence was not challenged by the premises license holders re representative. The premises license holders representative said the premises were taken over by the license holder in 2018, since which there had been no issue in the sale of tobacco or alcohol. The premises license holders representative referred to representations from staff in the community in support of the credibility of the running of the business. The subcommittee heard that following an earlier test purchase, there had been a joint visit with West Yorkshire Police and Trading Standards on Wednesday the 23rd December 2020, when a substantial amount of counterfeit tobacco was found. The license holder has failed to provide a credible account of how counterfeit cigarettes were sold from or concealed at the licensed premises. It was considered that the sophisticated manner of the concealment of the counterfeit cigarettes would afford a material prospect of their presence being within the knowledge of the licensee. Regard was had to the evidence of regulatory compliance officer Jason Lee Bethel from West Yorkshire Tr to Trading Standards that the sale of counterfeit tobacco is serious organised criminality. The subcommittee had regard to and gave considerable weight to the statutory guidance published under Section 182 of the Licensing Act that certain criminal activity that may arise at licensed premises should be treated particularly seriously. This included the sale and storage of counterfeit tobacco Paragraph 11.28 of the licensing guidance stated that where the licensing authority determined that the crime and prevention objective was being undermined through the use of the premises to further crimes, it was expected the revocation of the license, even in the first instance, should be seriously considered. The subcommittee felt if, that if the license remained in force, this would not meet the following licensing objectives. Prevention of crime and disorder, protection of children from harm, public safety. Therefore, the subcommittee decided to revoke the license all parties are advised that there is a right of appeal against this decision to the Magistrates Court within 21 days of the date of the decision. And that's the resolution that the subcommittee has um, come to. And that is, the, um, that is the end of the meeting. Thank you all parties for presenting, um, including you, Niaz, um, I thought you presented well. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, I'll, I'll let the meeting go. Could I ask that licensing officers and our legal advisor just stay at the end, please?
take it, you want us to take it 